Welcome back to chapter 25 in module 6. In this video we're going to talk about how different populations of stars that exist in the Milky Way galaxy can help us understand how the galaxy formed. So to start out with, we revisit some information that we first thought about for our own sun. Back in chapter 5, we talked about spectral lines and how they can help us figure out what elements are present within a star's outer layers. In chapter 15, we talked about how the strength of the lines tells us how much of each of those elements exist. A young or middle-aged star like the Sun, so a star that has formed in the last few billion years, has a huge amount of different chemical elements beyond just the hydrogen and helium that is so prevalent otherwise in the galaxy. This type of star that has a lot of these extra elements, um, astronomers call them metals, although chemists would probably flinch at that, um, but anything that isn't hydrogen or helium, astronomers tend to call metals, and so we talk about metallicity or metal content. A star with high metallicity, and even that just tends to mean 1-3% to of the star is composed of stuff that's not hydrogen or helium, that star is called a population 1 star. You can kind of imagine a little cartoon version of our sun holding a little foam finger that says, we're number 1. That's where we get that population um, 1 from, is that we just start with our star, because we like to be number 1. However... If we need to go with another population type, our sun is one of the youngest generations of stars. And so to go back in time to older stars, we have to call those population two. That might not be intuitive. That's what we are stuck with. So population one stars are stars that are found in the disk of the galaxy they have formed in the last few billion years. They all have nice flat plane um, orbits, nearly circular orbits, and it shows us what the galaxy itself was structured like when they formed. Population two stars, on the other hand, are found in the bulge or the halo, and they have randomly oriented eccentric orbits um, like is shown in the second um, picture here, the bottom part of the slide. Population 2 stars have a lot fewer metals. And so this um, little table that I've put together kind of summarizes the key differences in these two populations. So population 1 stars, like our sun, are found in the disk and in the spiral arms. Population 1 stars, like our sun, are considered metal-rich. They have a several percent of the things that aren't hydrogen and helium. The orbits are nice and flat and circularized. And population one stars, by definition, are younger stars. They're less than about 5 billion years. Population two stars, on the other hand, are found in the bulge and the halo. They have very few heavy elements. Their orbits are eccentric and tilted, and they tend to be much older, much, much older, like 10 billion years or 12 billion years. Now, I want us to try to think about this. Why do the younger stars, the ones in population one, why do they have more heavy elements than the population two stars do? Take a moment and pause the video to think through this. Now, before we answer the question, we also want to note that there's an elusive first set of stars that only contain hydrogen and helium. These are called population three stars. And if we think about that population of stars, they formed when the galaxy did, and all of the most massive ones have had a chance to live their entire lives. Most of those stars, even sun-like stars, would have lived through their entire lives and then died. Only the very dim M stars, the cold, small, low mass, low luminosity, red M stars would be the ones that still exist. And so they're really hard to find and even harder to verify are part of population three. Okay, so back to the question at hand then. 
Population one currently, new stars that form have a lot of metals. As we go back to further populations, including this elusive population three, we have fewer and fewer metals available. Stars themselves fuse hydrogen into helium. And when they leave the main sequence, they turn helium into carbon through the triple alpha process. Beyond that, though, the galaxy slowly gets polluted with these heavier elements as more time passes. Because stars are the things that are able to turn the hydrogen and helium that they start with into anything else. And it's important for us to recognize that through fusion, we can only get up to the end point of iron. We talked about that in the previous module. The end point of iron is the last thing stars are able to make and still get energy out of that process. Everything heavier than iron still has to come from some process in astronomy. We have a whole periodic table of elements, but they don't come out of nowhere. They had to come from astronomical processes. And so everything heavier than iron is made in extremely high energy events, environments like supernova explosions. And in fact, here is a graphic created by Jennifer Johnson of our current understanding of where these different elements form from. The darker blue is the start of the universe. We will talk about the Big Bang and Big Bang nucleosynthesis is gonna be a fancy word that comes up in our chapter 29 slides. We will talk about how we got hydrogen and helium. There's no other process that is creating hydrogen new um, except what we started the universe with, which was mostly hydrogen. In that dark blue, we get a tiny amount of lithium, element three on the periodic table, but for the most part, we don't get much of anything. When we talked about stars creating elements, we talked about how stars turn three helium into one carbon. So we skipped from two to six on the periodic table. And what that means is if we look at elements um, beryllium and boron, four and five, they're color-coded light pink here because really the only way that we make them is not by building them up through fusion, but by having them accidentally get made through fission. Cosmic rays, we're not gonna get into in this class really, but they're high energy protons that if they hit a bigger element just right, it can split it apart and create fission. And that's how we get um, elements four and five because stars don't make them for us. If you look at most of this, um, most of this periodic table though, in green, exploding massive stars, those are type two supernova. In light blue, exploding white dwarfs, that's type 1a supernova. In yellow, dying low mass stars, that's as we create the planetary nebula, there is some additional fusion that can happen. And then in orange, merging neutron stars, that is a field of astronomy that is still fairly new. We have only been able to detect gravitational waves for a couple of years now, and so our understanding will grow and grow over the course of time as we find more of these signals and analyze them with more detail. So just kind of a connection to the fact that when we think about the stuff that everything in the room around us is made out of, all of that stuff had to come from what stars do. Kind of cool. Okay, so back to the formation of the galaxy itself. When the galaxy formed, it was mostly just hydrogen and helium. And these different populations of stars that led to our discussion of where elements come from, population one and population two, they are kind of like snapshots of what the properties of the galaxy looked like when those stars formed. Population one stars are showing us what the galaxy is like now. Population two stars kind of show us what the population, uh, what the um, galaxy used to look like, a snapshot of the history of the galaxy. So the galaxy structure that we see today that we talked about in the first video of module six is likely some combination of what we call top-down models and bottom-up models. 
it is still an ongoing source of research to make sure we really understand how galaxy formation works. That comes down to two main possible ideas. The top-down models are sometimes called monolithic collapse, and they look very similar to the way that star formation looked back in um, the previous module. We have this big cloud of gas and dust, galaxy-sized this time, that collapses, something causes that collapse, and as it collapses, it starts to flatten out. We talked about that for stars too. That's why we have all of our planets in a protoplanetary disk. We had that phrase before. Okay, so big cloud of gas and dust collapses down. As it collapses down, we start to form the earliest stars, the population three stars, and eventually the population two stars in the halo as they, as they um, form during this process. As that collapse continues, things start to flatten out and circularize, and that's why the population one stars are only in the disk of the galaxy and have such nice, smooth, flat orbits. All of that seems fine and good, and a lot of students kind of prefer this model as it making perfect sense to them, but there are some major issues with it. Step one of having this massive galaxy-sized cloud that just happens to collapse there are a lot of unknowns there that are kind of like swept under the rug. One of the other major types of models are multiple merger models or merger tree models, sometimes called bottom-up models, where we had smaller clouds of gas and dust that started to form what we might think of as proto-galaxies. And those clouds of gas and dust, those proto-galaxies kind of collected together somewhat like planet formation, um, which we haven't talked about as much yet, but will in module seven. One of the big things to be aware of is that the merger model has a lot of ongoing evidence to support that whether or not it's the primary method that the galaxy formed with, there are ongoing mergers and evidence of past mergers as well. So star streams um, shown here in an artist's conception, basically show us the evidence of a former galaxy that has been ripped apart by the gravity of the Milky Way galaxy and kind of incorporated within our galaxy to make it larger. Globular clusters, several of them have been identified as known smaller galaxies that are now part of the Milky Way. So globular cluster M54, part of the Messier Objects Catalog, is shown here. And it's thought to be the nucleus of a dwarf galaxy that has been merged with the Milky Way. There's now at least 12 small galaxies that we can kind of trace back. Used to be their own thing, but the Milky Way ate them. And there is a phrase used in um, this field called galactic cannibalism. The Milky Way galaxy is eating up smaller galaxies and incorporating them into its larger structure. The other thing to be aware of is when the Milky Way basically incorporates these smaller galaxies, it still retains its overall structure. But in several billion years, the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda galaxy, another separate spiral galaxy, will begin this collision that will take a few billion years to complete, but in the end, they will lose all of their nice structure. We can't retain our structure when we combine with something that is similar in size, and Andromeda Galaxy is very similar in size. And so this set of beautiful um, artist conception renderings shows us what the sky will look like over this billion years dance of these galaxies going through each other and past each other and eventually merging into one just blob of stars. One thing to be aware of is when we see all of this beautiful lit up star formation in our sky, even when galaxies merge together, stars themselves do not hit each other. The space between stars is so large that the structures themselves come together, but stars don't like crash into each other um, during this process. There's just too much space in between them. 
So we will, um, we will leave it at that, although we will be talking about what elliptical galaxies are in the next video when we get to chapter 26. Uh, and we'll be thinking a little bit more about where the Andromeda galaxy is now in this module as well when we talk about our galactic address. So I will see you in those next videos.